I've watched guys fight carburation at idle for, for a season or two and never figure it out. Can it turn? Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Today we're gonna to be discussing carburetors. We're gonna start with the, about the mid to late 80s when the modern technology carburetors came into the scene. And we're gonna discuss them all the way through the turn of the century till they stopped using carburetors and went to fuel injection. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna show you guys the Kian 28 carburetor. They call it a Kian 28 because the Venturi is 28 millimeter. Notice how it only has one side. This side is smooth over here. There's no fuel pump. It's an externally fuel pump utilized carburetor. Now I already have the fuel plate off. We'll show you guys that here in a little bit. They're the same on all the Kians. But what I want to show you is if you look in here, this step here, everybody wants to measure this step and say, well, it's not really 28 millimeters. Well, if you look up in there farther, Kian actually measures the Venturi above the throttle plate. That's why it's a 28. That is actually 28 millimeters. Now, if you measure it like we do the Makunis, you'll say it's a 34 millimeter carb. I'm okay with that. I still call it a 34 millimeter carb after all these years because I cut my teeth on the Makuni carburetors. So once you understand that difference, you'll see that that's why they call this a 28. And this came on all the, all the 650s from 86 to 90. This was a very popular carburetor. The important thing to realize with all these Kians is that they were all, they were all sold and shipped from Kian North America for oil injection. So that makes it really interesting when you go to premix how you have to change the jetting on these. So the next up is the Kian 38. It looks very familiar, it looks very similar to the 28. However, on the other side of it, there's a fuel pump. So you can see it's double-sided. The fuel pump is internal to this and it actually pumps fuel. This channel here, it pumps fuel across the carburetor into the fuel chamber. So I'm gonna set this fuel pump down. It's a very cool fuel pump. If you look up in there as well, same thing. It's gonna be measured at the step, the second step, not the first step. This actually measures 40 millimeter. This is actually a 38 millimeter carb. So be aware of where you need to measure them. Another cool fact of the Kians are the bolts go all the way through the carburetor. It makes it very easy to install and uninstall these when they're in the boat. So here's the fuel plate. The fuel plate comes off, or the fuel plate cover comes off and exposes the diaphragm. The diaphragm is what, I call it breathing, it breathes. It's gonna, it's gonna pulse back and forth between the fuel pump, creating pressure on the back side of this, and this little spring armature here. That is your needle and seat. This dictates all your fuel flow for the whole spectrum of the carb, and it is adjustable. The spring is adjustable, the tension at which that pops off is adjustable, and the hole size is adjustable. Now if you notice right there, there's a one. This jet block plate is replaceable with different sizes. That gives you the different sized holes. Now when you run premix, the, the oil and fuel mixture is thicker, so the fuel, the hole will be bigger. So if you put a, a larger number, like a one and a half or a two fuel plate on your carburetor, that will give you more fuel flow when oil is mixed with the gas. Now by the mid 90s, Kawasaki figured this out and they actually changed these fuel plates on these carburetors and they set the oil injection oil to be pumped into the carburetor area to blend with it. And so those fuel plates are very desirable and they're very obvious to see because they have, a, they have an oil, uh, oil spout on the side where the oil injection lines would go into. So if you just plug those off and you can run premix, the carburetor, you shouldn't have to make any changes to the carburetor because it's already designed to run with the oil blended into the fuel at the carburetor. So these plates come off, there's a screw right here and this plate separates very easily, right? So there's a screw there, screw comes out, this pops off and you clean be behind this is a screen and you don't want, you got to check that screen every now and then. That's part of your maintenance program is to clean the screen and make sure there's no debris behind the fuel plate. That will affect fuel flow and cause you to have a lean issue. So those are the Kians. And if you see a Kian that's blue, right? It's going to look total, it's going to look very different than this inside. It's going to look the same outside, but it's blue. 
Those are the racing version of the Kians made by, imported by Sudco. And those are very desirable. Those flow fuel and oil very well. Those, were, those came from Sudco ready for oil injection. They were for race use only, right? Because they're not emissions legal. That's why they're very desirable and they're very expensive to, these, to this day. Those are your Kians. This here is a Makuni. And this is a Makuni I-Series, but it's, it's together and assembled. The original SBN series Makuni I have, but it's all disassembled so I can show you guys the internals of it. The footprint's the same. They turn the fuel plate 45 degrees for the lower profile. And they, they, took, a, they took Kian's example and made the through bolt because this flange bolt here is very difficult to bolt to the engine when the engine's in the ski. So Makuni took a cue from Kian and said, okay, we're gonna make a through bolt pattern here. And it worked out much better. But the mechanics and the fundamentals of the carburetor are still the same. You have the fuel pump and you have the fuel set up here and it sends it through a tube. Oops. Sends it through a tube across the carburetor. And then you have a diaphragm here. Diaphragm works the same way. It pushes on this lever here. And again, the spring is adjustable. The pressure is adjustable. The needle and seat's adjustable and it's way easier to change on a Makuni because it's just a little needle and seat that slides in there. They're very replaceable. And there's two or three different sizes or three or four different sizes of those. And then once you get that far, this plate here, these two screws, that plate comes out and reveals the main jet and the pilot jet. And those all changeable. That's what sets your jetting, which gives you your carburation for any particular ski. So the Makunis are measured at the throttle plate. So you see this step in here? A lot of people want to measure just the outside perimeter. That's going to be larger because there's a step in there. The step at the throttle plate is what tells you this is a 44 millimeter carb. Now I can tell it's a 44 millimeter because of the big step right there. The 46 millimeter carb has a shallower step. And you can, again, you measure it at the throttle plate, not at the end of the carburetor. That's what confuses a lot of people. Now this is an aftermarket carburetor. Andrew Buck, Buckshot Carburetors, he modified the stock Makuni and made it way better. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of manufacturers, a lot of uh, tuners doing this, or was doing it 20 years ago. A lot of them have gone away, but the grades were Blackjack, Buckshot, uh, Novi, Full Spectrum, all those guys, they made some fantastic carburetors. But as you can see, they still started out with a basic Makuni 46 millimeter carb. Now we have, we understand the carburetor part of it. But what does that have to do with carburation? Uh, how does that, does, is this all we need? You know, if, if we get this right, will the ski run really well, right? That's carburation. Everything happens in the carburetor. That's not true. It's the farthest thing from being true, actually. If you, you know, I've made a little, <laughs> excuse the crudity here, it's kind of comical, but I mean, we have an impeller, right? Impeller size dictates carburation. The reduction nozzle, the nozzle at the back of the ski where the steering nozzle is, that reduces the water initially, that's the reduction nozzle. You change the size of that nozzle, you change carburation, right? If you change timing, if you alter timing, that changes carburation. If you, if you, depending on where your port timing is, no two motors are the same. No two motors come from the factory with proper, perfect port timing. They're always off a couple thousands here or there. That affects carburation every time. Compression, if you change the compression, no two skis have the same compression. They'll be close, but any kind of compression change will change carburation. Right, engine RPM. When you're at full throttle and you're driving across the water, where that end RPM sits at full throttle is different on every ski. That affects carburation. Engine load. You can't load a two-stroke. Rule number one, you can't load a two-stroke. People don't seem to understand that. Engine load changes carburation. I've watched guys fight carburation at idle for, for a season or two and never figure it out. And it turns out their, their impeller was so tall, it loaded the motor so hard at idle, when he pulled the throttle, the carburetor wouldn't work. It wouldn't, it wouldn't open up and let fuel through. 
And he struggled with this for a whole season. And I told him, I said, hey, what impeller are you running? He didn't know. He comes up and says, hey, what jetting do I need to run to accomplish carburation for my ski? And I'm like, well, that's like asking me for a combination to a combination lock. Right? Combination lock is three numbers. Very simple. If I asked you, what's the third number of the combination to open this lock? It's like, well, that's not going to do you any good. You need all of them. It's a combination lock. You need all three of the numbers to open the lock. Well, you need all these variables to come up with decent jetting to make carburation. And if you change any one of these, the numbers that we give you aren't going to work. But now, now 30 years later, this industry is no longer young. If you talk to people in the industry and you say, hey, this is the impeller size I have, this is the reduction nozzle I have, this is the port timing I have, this is the compression I have, this is the timing I'm running, and this is the engine RPM I'm running. They'll be able to tell you numbers for jetting that get you pretty close within a couple of jet sizes that you can find, that you can go out to the lake and test and you can come up with a very good running ski. But without, without that, you're throwing darts at a dartboard. It, you're really guessing and you don't wanna guess. And I have people ask me all the time, what, what dyno do you use to come up with this? I have the best dyno on the planet. I have a lake five minutes away from my house. It's the perfect dyno. It gives me 100% accuracy every time. It never never fails. It never doesn't work. It never ha comes up with voodoo numbers. I go to the lake, I put the ski on the water, and it gives me my data every time. And it may not be the data I wanna see, but it's the best dyno I've ever found. So this being said, whenever somebody asks for, that's why when you go on the forums and you see people asking for jetting, and it upsets the people that are in the know. They're like, you can't, you, you're, you're asking for the third number of a combination lock. It means nothing. The number is 27. What does that mean? I don't know. Well, it's a number. You ask for one number, doesn't matter. You're never gonna open that lock anyway, right? And that's what, it's hard for people to wrap their head around that. So again, when you start over here and you end up over here, it will help you get your better jetting set up. And that's why the guys at elevation, if you're at 5,000 feet, the, the guys that live up in the elevation, I'm always getting questions all the time. What about the upper elevation? Well, upper elevation, the air's thinner, okay? So what does that mean? That means you can run higher compression to yield the same result. That's why you guys up in Colorado, you can buy 85 octane fuel. 85, you know, our cars won't run on 85 octane fuel down here at sea level. But up there, 5,000 feet, the air's so thin, the cars don't, the cars burn it, the cars think it's 87 octane based on all the data that's not changed. If you raise your, you're gonna run higher compression at altitude with the same jetting and the same everything else being equal, because the engine will think that the higher compression is at sea level compression. The difference is you're still gonna end up running rich because the, everything's thinner. The, the pressure on the water, the air, the atmosphere pushing on the water is less. So the water is less dense. It will go through the impeller better, more efficiently. It's not gonna load the motor as hard. Again, same scenario, right? When people ask me, well, I'm at elevation, how does that affect my jetting? Well, you don't just jet and fix it. You have to change compression. You have to change impeller size. It'll change your engine load automatically because there's less pressure on the water. So see how, it all, see how it all gets really confusing really quick. But all this becomes easy with testing. Get out on the water, take your data, take your tachometer, take your temperature probes, it's all there. Go to the lake, that's your best dyno you'll ever use. So I hope that helps guys. I hope it gives you a direction that you can go positively moving forward with jetting your skis and understanding carburation. So thanks for watching.